the where you stand with God, ask yourself, I might be doing all these good things, but is there something in my life that Jesus, at the end of my life, at the end of time, will come up to me and say, you've done all these good things, but I have this against you. So in light of recent events, pretty sure we've all seen it floating around everybody's social media, every Christian circle is covering it. Many conservative pages and many people that hold influence talk about the unfortunate events that are happening around in Paris, which is the blasphemous and distasteful mockery of the Last Supper. And many Christians are using their platform to call that out. And that's amazing. That's, that's a very good thing. This is the thing. This is something that nobody's talking about. All that stuff of calling the stuff out is good. I'm calling it out myself too. It's wrong. It's blasphemy. It's mockery against God. Not even the demons, which are superior in power to humans. The demonic entities that are out, that are out there. The demonic entities that, are, that got entrapped and chained in the Euphrates River. Those things are superior in power, superior in strength, superior in knowledge and speed. Yet they fear God, but humans do not fear God. But this is the other thing. Many Christians, I don't know if they're finally being perceptive of the evil that's happening. If they are, awesome. Welcome to the train. Jump on the train. But notice how they'll only participate when everybody else is participating. Notice how they'll only participate when it's people of influence that are sharing their thoughts on it notice how they participate when it's blatant but notice when it's hidden things nobody really says anything because they're not like that in the spirit when you're like that in the spirit you you can tell with your spiritual eyes you can see with this with the, with your spiritual eyes the holy spirit gives you the discernment to see what is hiding when it's blatant, it's obvious to everybody, even the unbelievers. That doesn't really set you apart. Even conservatives and unbelievers are calling it out. It's a good thing that people are doing that. But, let me read to you something in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 is a rebuke to several churches. And notice this, the way that it is written. This is Jesus speaking. This is red letters, Revelation chapter 2. I know your works, your toil... And your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. But I have this against you. Look at this. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen repent and do the works you did at first. If not I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That was to the church of Ephesus. Now look at this, to the church of Smyrna. These are all believers that Jesus is rebuking. Look, now to the church of Smyrna. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those that say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now to the church of Pergamum, another body of believers. This is the third one that we're reading so far. I know where, this is Jesus speaking, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Now to the fourth one, to the church of Thyatira. Jesus told that church, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual morality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. How many churches was that? That was Ephesus was one church. The church of Smyrna was church number two. The church of Pergamon was church number three. The church of Thyatira was church number four. What is my point here? My point here is... All those churches were doing things that were good. They were doing things that were worthy of applause. They were good deeds that the church were doing. They were calling out the false things. Like the church of Ephesus. But Jesus had a few things against those churches. One of them was that they had lost their first love. I'm saying this because there's many Christians calling out the falsehood in Paris because it's blatant. It's obvious. Even the unbelievers see it. But when it comes to their personal life, they don't bother repenting they don't bother going deeper with the lord guys just because you you don't agree with what's going on in paris doesn't mean you're legit and i'm saying this because examine yourself and 
as in examine your own spiritual life. Why is it that many Christians jump on the train? They jump on the bandwagon when everybody else is doing the same thing. When everybody else decides to say something, now you want to say something. That doesn't make you brave. What makes you brave is when nobody's talking about it. And you decide to speak out. When you decide to, to stand up for the things of God, even when nobody's saying absolutely nothing. Oh, but now people are saying stuff. And now, you know, the, everybody apparently is a Christian now. He's like, hey, if you were really a Christian, you would stick, you would, you would, you would still, you would speak even when nobody else is speaking. You would speak even though nobody supports you. You would speak when nobody's saying anything. Then, that that's genuine fruit, right? Just because we say something that we don't agree with when everybody else is saying the exact same thing, because again, it's obvious. Doesn't mean that we're legit, right? How many how many of us will be the the Church of Ephesus where we call the things that are false out, but Jesus comes up to us and says. I have this against you that you have lost your first love. How do you know that you have lost your first love for Jesus when you when you don't live for Him and when you you don't have fellowship with Him in private when nobody's watching? Do you still love on the Lord? Do you still seek Him in prayer? Do you still fast? Do you still walk in the Spirit when nobody's watching? The Church of Ephesus called the the false apostle false. We just read it right there in Revelation chapter 2. They called out things that were false. Every church had its good deeds. They say, I see that the, the good deeds that you do. But I have this against you. God is not mocked. When you, know, you, you actually know that when, when we call something out that's already blatant. Blatant means obvious. But we do it in a self-righteous way. But what if we're actually living a lukewarm lifestyle but don't do anything to change about it in our lives? That's wrong. When a lot of people that are calling out the mockery, I'm saying this in general for the masses on YouTube. They're calling out the wrong things, which is good. Yet they don't do anything about their own lukewarm lifestyle. Lukewarm doesn't necessarily mean that you say bad words or you partake in the things of the world. Lukewarm can also mean that you're not even on fire for God. Lukewarm can also mean that you're you're um you're not alive in the spirit. Lukewarm doesn't mean that you 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 just you know stay away from the worldly things. That's that that's a good discipline, right? It becomes consecration when you walk in the spirit and you do it because of the Holy Spirit leading you to do it. Because you want more of God, then it becomes spiritual. Then there's life in that. Why are you why are you not partaking in this? Because I belong to God. But if there's a sincerity to it, that's when it counts. When you just stay away from that stuff, but you want nothing to do with God. When it has nothing to do with God. When it when it's just, you know, even to pres preserve your, your religious image, that doesn't mean anything. If you don't have a relationship with God, that doesn't mean anything if you're not close to God. You know, many Christians are calling this out. But many of them are living a lukewarm lifestyle. Many of them have not even repented from their own sins. They continue fornicating. They, they continue saying bad words it is they can they continue partaking in the things of the world they continue the worldly lifestyle it's cliche and as cringy as that term might seem it is what it is to live a worldly lifestyle means that you're not on fire for god you're not 100 percent with god if you were at 100 percent with god this wouldn't be the first thing you say this wouldn't be the first thing that you're actually let me put it this way if you have not done anything about your life if you have not repented genuinely if you have not if you're not on fire for God, and you're just, you know, saying, and, and if you're just calling this stuff out, because everybody else is calling it out, you got to examine your own life, man. You got to examine your own spiritual life. And I'm telling you for your own good, you know, for your benefit. I'm doing this out of love for you. This is I don't hear anybody talking about this. Everybody's just talking about how bad the event is and how evil the, the mockery of, of the Last Supper is, which it is. It is. I'm not watching the Olympics this year. I'm not going to watch it at all. People are boycotting it, and I'm with them. I'm not. I'm not going to turn on the channel. But what about our own personal life with Jesus? How closely to God are we walking? How closely to the fellowship are we fellowshipping? How much of our time are we are we giving to the Holy Spirit? How much of our time are we giving to ourselves in prayer, in fellowship with other genuine believers? I'm not saying believers that don't produce fruit. I'm not talking about believers that that just go just to hang out but have no spiritual fruit among them. I'm talking about believers that that are that light you on fire for God. Those are the good type of believers that you should be around. Not those that are lukewarm that only, you know, they have the title, but there's no spiritual fruit. 
how much of our time are we really giving to God? Are we the church of Ephesus? Are we the church of Thyatira? Are we the church of Smyrna? All those churches were doing good things. And, and this is a body of believers that, that Jesus is calling out. These are not worldly people that Jesus is calling out. These are, these are people that are in the church that claim to be believers, that claim to be Christians. And Jesus still had a few things against them. Let me tell you why. Because those people didn't repent. Every one of those rebukes, all four rebukes, it says, Jesus, Jesus would say, I gave you time to repent. When you repent, Jesus doesn't hold it against you anymore. But if you deliberately keep on sinning, like it says in Hebrews, there is no atonement for those sins anymore. So if we deliberately keep on sinning, even when we receive knowledge of the truth, there's no atonement. And it will lead you to that exact same spot where Jesus will go up to you and say, I know the good things that you do. I know you serve in church. I know you called out the Paris event. I know that you participated in community events. I know you even preached at church. I, I know you even played at church. I know you ministered. But I have this against you. That's a scary thing. I'm not omit from it either. As a matter of fact, this message is for myself too. I have to examine my own spiritual life. As much as everybody does. You know, it's good that we're calling these things out. Which are diabolical. They're horrible. Yeah, the devil is right there. It's obvious. It's been obvious to the, to the ones that have seen the spirit for, for a lot. Forever. Those that have seen the spirit, they get a new lens. And then when they become, when they when they fellowship with the Holy Spirit close, the Holy Spirit shows you spiritual things behind the scenes. Guys, this is nothing new for those that seen the Spirit. This is this was obvious. What I'm trying to get at is don't let this be a one-time event where you stand up for Jesus. If you really want to stand up for Jesus, preach the word, evangelize, preach the truth, even when nobody's preaching the truth, even when people are against, even when other fellow believers are are against you because a real believer will never oppose the real message of Jesus. Right? I'm not saying you're preaching half truths. People are obviously gonna say something, right? If you're preaching half truths, a real Christian will say, hey, that's not entirely true. You gotta preach the entire truth. Repent and believe the gospel. That is the entire truth. But let this event not be that only that one and only time that we decide to say something because if this is if this is the, if that's the case examine your own faith man examine your own faith because this is just means that we're just piggybacking off of somebody else what happened to the foolish virgins the foolish virgins ran out of oil and they wanted somebody else's oil because they didn't have oil themselves are you part of that group of the foolish virgins that doesn't have any oil for themselves that they had to borrow off of somebody else that to piggyback off of somebody else because they didn't have their own anointing and that's scary. And that's the reality of, of, of right now that many Christians are speaking against the event, which, uh, which again, keep doing that. Which, again, keep it up. You know, call out sin for what it is. It's evil, it's blasphemous, it's mocking Jesus. The reverence should be there. But two, so that you can examine your own life and your own stance of where you stand with God. Ask yourself, I might be doing all these good things, but is there something in my life that Jesus, at the end of my life, at the end of time, will come up to me and say, you've done all these good things, but I have this against you. You don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I'm terrified of that. And you should be too. Another angle. If this is the first time that you're calling something out because somebody else is doing it, then get momentum off of this experience. And if God is calling you to the ministry, get it with God. Get it with God. Get it for real with God. Consecrate. Live a holy lifestyle out of love and reverence for Him. Go deep with God. Take this, take this as the first step and keep it up, man. Preach the word. Preach the truth of God. The word says that the world hates Jesus because he accuses the world of doing evil. Let's not befriend the world. Let's not water it down and say, oh, we must love and tolerate. Love was never tolerance in the eyes of Jesus. He sat with sinners and ate with tax collectors, but to call them out of repentance. And those people that sat with Jesus had left everything behind to follow him. Jesus at one point never, never affirmed anybody's sin. He never affirmed anybody's sin. The religious Pharisees were counterfeits because they wanted, they were, they had this self-righteous mindset that because they did things in the natural, but had no relationship with God, then they were good with God. In in the same book of John, 
So here's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But this is the thing that people don't talk about. Keep reading the rest, man. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does, listen to this, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Holy Son of God. Verse 19, look at this one too. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it, it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. It says right there, the world never received Jesus himself because he accused the world of doing evil. It doesn't say tolerate the person's sin. It doesn't say, you know, be okay with the sin. We got to love. Yes, we, we're talking about this because we want those souls to repent. Yes, I love the trans person. Yes, I love the homo person. But I'm not going to reaffirm their sin. Everybody's a sinner. When they come to Christ, those sins get blotted. I'm not saying, and I'm saying coming to Christ genuinely. When, as in when they repent and turn to God. Not by just holding the title of a Christian, going to church, showing up to church one or a few times, but have no fruit in their life. Genuine fruit in their life. Outside of church counts more than being in church with no fruit. Let me say it again. Not going to a church and having spiritual fruit with the Holy Spirit. Genuine born again fruit. Not your own fruit that you invented in your mind or the fruit that you agree with or, or you know, this idea that you made up in your mind that you take things out of the word and, you know, you only take some parts and, and not all of it. No, take the entire word of God. Repent from all sin and turn to him. The Holy Spirit washes your mind. Gives you new wiring. Fruit like that has more value than going to a church and not having none of that fruit. It's better to be born again, repent from all sin, and turn to God. Turn to Jesus for the remission of your sins. Than to go to a church for a few times, to go to church on a few events, on a few Sundays, but not repent. And not turn to God. Going to church in the eyes of God has no value if you don't repent and turn to Him. Guys, don't lose sight of the first love, Jesus. Stay real with him. Don't, don't use this event as a one-time thing, but use this as a piggyback. If this is your first time speaking out against evil, don't let this be the only time you actually say something. If you're for real about God, then keep it consistent. Even if you look stupid, what does it say in, in, in one of Paul's letters? It says, for if I want to please man, then I cannot please God. It's either one or the other. You can't. Please man and God at the same time. Either you live for the opinion of man, for the support of man, or you live for the applause of God. And this also goes to people in the church. Either you care about the leader, what the leaders in your church say, or you care about what God says. Because even a majority of the time, those two, both of those opinions are completely different. As a matter of fact, God doesn't have an opinion. He has facts. God only speaks facts because, again, He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. God's opinion is not opinion. God's, God's, whatever comes out of God's mouth is a fact. Keep that in mind. All right. So, don't be a coward. Don't be a wimp. You know, grow a backbone and preach the word for what it is. Don't just do this one time or or occasionally. Be consistent with it. Have consistent fruit, and that's important. Otherwise, you don't want at the end of your life or at the end of time for Jesus to go up to you and say. You did all these good things, but I have this against you. All right, guys, subscribe to the channel. Comment and let me know where you're watching from. If this is your first time here on the channel, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell notification icon. Share this video with somebody that needs to hear this, somebody that's, that you know is lukewarm. Send them this video, let them know. Hey, bro, you're lukewarm. God wants you to repent and turn to him 100%. Give him your life. All right, guys. Laters.